folks. Uh, my name is Carl Alfonso. I'm the production stage manager for the show. Um, also on stage my team. Hi, I'm Ray Gonzalez. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be the production assistant for Mother Road. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to cough this stuff by introducing themselves. Uh, if you would stand up, say your name, and what role you're playing. Is that anybody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, him. I'm playing uh, Roger and some other people. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Murphy playing Will Jones. He, him. Cedric Lamar. He, him, his. And I'm playing James. Uh, Fidel Gomez. He, him, his. I'm playing Curtis and Abelardo's father. I'm Carol Zeller, she, her, hers, and I'm playing Amelia. I'm Amy Lazardo, uh, she, her, hers, and I'm playing Mo. Uh, Tony Sancho, he, him, his, and I am playing Martin. Uh, Catherine Castiano, she, her, hers, um, I be the waitress and a police officer and other people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Armando Duran, playing, oh, he, him, his, playing Abelardo. And I first came to this festival 20 years ago to do a play called El Paso Blue. Oh. Thank you guys. Uh, if I could ask the creative team to now introduce yourselves. Mike Espinosa, voice and text, she, her, hers. Uh, Kareem Fahmy, he, him, his. I'm the Phil Killian Directing Fellow this season, and I'm the Assistant Director. <laughs> uh, Octavius Felici, I'm is I'm the playwright. <laughs> Bill Rao, she, him, his, director. Christopher Acebo, I'm the set designer. Carolyn Mazuka, she, her, hers, I'm the costume designer. Sherelle Guyton, she, her, hers, hair and wig designer. Tiffany Ana Lopez, she, her, hers, dramaturg. Thank you. Bill. Thank you, Carl. Hi, everybody. Hi, hey, thank you so much for the switch time. We were going to uh, do it later this afternoon, and we realized we could get better attendance uh, by, uh, by, by uh, especially our playwright, <laughs> um, by moving thank it to you. the early afternoon. So thank you. Thank re you. Really appreciate everybody rolling with that, and that so many of you were able to come. Thank um, you. It's nice to see so many seats filled um, as we talk about this play. So uh, when I was appointed artistic director, Octavio Solis was among the very first playwrights that I sought to commission. Um, literally, Louis Douthin and I reached out to three writers on the same day, and Octavio was one of those three. Uh, so it seems fitting that Mother Road, which is his fourth production at the festival, not only makes him one of our most widely produced living authors, in the festival's history, but will be the final world premiere of an original play that I have the privilege of directing in my last season as artistic director. My <coughs> They're applauding that I'm leaving. Did you notice that? <laughs> and I'm, I'm not going to take it personally. <coughs> my own past attracts me to this stunning new play. Uh, because, uh, as many of you know, I spent the first five years of my career on the road. Uh, Cornerstone Theater Company that Allison Carey and I co-founded, uh, we created uh, plays with low-income rural communities throughout the United States. Mother Road was born out of a remarkable road trip that Octavio took himself, which he might tell us a little bit about. Um, but I will just say briefly, it was with the Steinbeck uh, National Center, and he traveled the exact same route that the Jodes took from Salisaw, Oklahoma, to the migrant farm worker camps of California. And in the process, Octavio does what he does as an artist. He opened his ears and his eyes and his heart to how things have and haven't changed in the 80 years since John Steinbeck captured our nation's class-rooted divisions in his celebrated novel. Octavio's work is uh, rooted in the same moral outrage about economic injustice that makes The Grapes of Wrath a beloved American classic. It also brilliantly activates this theme in a contemporary context. It conveys the fears and the glorious promise of this particular moment in the United States 
as we transition from a white majority to a society that will soon be majority people of color. The play proposes the inevitability of a diverse new American family that draws parallels between who we've been and who we are becoming. In recent years, Octavio has also been a farmer, uh, raising chickens and goats on his land right here in the Rogue Valley. He's also a local playwright, which is an unbelievable gift to have one of our great national playwrights also be a local writer. So with this burnished poetry that is an ever-present part of his voice, uh, our now local playwright uh, works from a personal understanding as a farmer of our relationship to the earth. I, I feel like this profound love of the land forms yet another connection between Steinbeck's time and America today. It's this gorgeous bridge between Depression era, Okies, as they're referred to in The Grapes of Wrath and in, in our play, and today's largely immigrant migrant farm workers. As I reflect on everything that has been accomplished in the communion between OSF and our audience members in these remarkable 12 years that I have been so privileged to work for this company during, my heart swells with pride. And as I consider my own grief in stepping down and stepping away from this beloved company and the journey that lies before me and my family, I am mindful that Octavio's play offers hope for both what lies ahead and that someday we can perhaps come home again. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to you, my brother. I'm astounded by how beautifully you put this bill. This is really, really very moving. Very, very, very honored. Thank you. Thank you. It's our honor to do your play. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I, I, I used to, I started coming here uh, to see plays at the OSF uh, practically when I moved to San Francisco in 1989. By 1990, we were already coming here to see shows. But I never, never, ever entertained the notion that I would ever have a play done here. Because it was Shakespeare and Broadway show, you know, stuff that was off Broadway or Broadway, new plays, and August Wilson. Uh, and, and that was, I mean, those are, that's pretty big. That's pretty, those are the giants. But uh, uh, I never entertained that it would happen until I got a call and they, and, and Libby Apple uh, and, and Louis Douthat and Doug Langworthy asked, do you have a play that we could do here, that we could do as a reading? And, and I said, yeah, and we, we read El Paso Blue, and, and it just, uh, they, they knew, and I knew it was going to happen. Uh, we couldn't do it until 1999, and that's when Armando, and uh, that, that's when we brought Armando into this family, and that's when I really actually became a member of this family. And ever since then, they have brought me back, and brought me back, and brought me back, and have trusted their stages and their beautiful company uh, to, to my plays. Um, and, and, and as my wife neared retirement, uh, it, just, it just seemed like this is where we need to be if, if I were going to settle anywhere. Uh, and if I would do my plays in any one theater and none other, it would be here. <laughs> um, so that's, that's first. That's, that's why we moved here. But the, uh, but the, other, the other thing is, is that uh, when... <clears throat> When Colleen Bailey at the National Steinbeck Center asked me to, to join him on this trip in anticipation of the 75th uh, anniversary, anniversary of the publication of The Grapes of Wrath, um, I, I seized the opportunity and said, yes, I'll go, I'll go. And we went, three artists, a visual artist, uh, Patricia Wakita, a film and video director, PJ Palmer, and myself as, as a writer. And we collected oral histories along the way. We heard so many people's stories. Uh, the homeless, people who are coming from broken homes, people who are dealing with addiction, survivors of the Dust Bowl and the Depression and World War II, survivors of racism uh, of the worst kind, and, uh, and just stories of survival of Americans uh, 
in, in indefatigable spirit in the face of, of so many o overwhelming odds. And, uh, but in all the people, in the stories of all the people we heard, no one had ever uh, read The Grapes of Wrath. No one had even seen the movie. And some people in Oklahoma actually resented the novel. They thought it cast the people of Oklahoma in such a negative light. Uh, but they'd never read the novel. <laughs> so I found it really curious. Uh, and I didn't know what, my, what I was going to write. Everyone else knew what they were doing, but I didn't know what I was doing on this trip. I, I thought my, I might write some poems or something. Um, and I was reading the novel on the way there, too. I read it back in high school, but gosh, it was nothing like reading it while you're <laughs> looking down and looking up and seeing things reflected right back at you that how, how, how much things have changed and how little they have changed in, in mm -hmm. 75 years, 76 years. Um, and so it wasn't until we arrived at Weed Patch outside of uh, Bakersfield in, our, in the city of Arvin, and it was also known as now as the Arvin Migrant Center, uh, which is actually in the novel and was built there for the people that came uh, from the Dust Bowl, escaping the Dust Bowl, looking for work. And it was there that I realized that, that, I, that I saw that all the people, all the families that live there now are Mexican. They come from Mexico and they follow the pisca, they go working uh, the fields, picking uh, the fruit and vegetables that we eat that are a part of our, our, our national diet. Um, and there I met one young man who had lived there as a, as a boy and was now a uh, spoken word artist and a muralist and uh, a roofer <laughs> and a con carpenter, construction worker. And he told us, he, he said to me one thing, he said, we, when we asked him, have you ever read The Grace of Wrath? And he said, yes, I read it. I read it many times. I know it by heart. And he started reciting passages by heart uh, from, from the novel. He knew it so well. And I asked him, why, how do you know it so well? It says, because I am the new Tom Joad. I am Tom Joad. This story is about me. We, the people that live here, are the new Okies. We are the new Okies. And this novel is speaking to is about me and my life. And then I knew the story I was going to do. Then I knew what the play was that I had to write. Um, and that's the journey that I have taken over five years, uh, over multiple drafts. I think I'm on draft 11 now. Uh, when we open, it'll be draft 12 or 13. <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> but but, the, but that's that's a perfect segue to what I'm going to say now, and that's that I am honored to be working with the greatest company of actors in the world. They are here. They're all here, and, and they're in my play. And they and what's amazing about them is they take on the words I have written to them with such conviction. And they find themselves in them. They find their own stories in them until, they, until the words are in their lifeblood. And then, just like that, when I rewrite them, they... <laughs> <laughs> they shed them. And then they take on the next batch of words, and the same thing happens. That's, it, it seems like a Sisyphean task, but oh my god. They bring it every time. And that's what's incredible about, that's why I wanted to work with this company, because they have that kind of faith and that kind of trust in the text no matter what. And also, they're the kind of company that will, that will challenge me. As much as they are changed by the work, they're changing me. This company of actors is already changing me and my text. It's responding to them. That's what is marvelous about theater, this symbiotic relationship between us as artists. That's why I'm not, ultimately, I'm not a poet, I'm not a novelist, I'm not a solo performer. I am a playwright because I love this collaborative uh, process that theater is about. That's why I'm in the room. That's why they're in the room. And that's what makes this whole thing so special. So I, I, I feel like I'm in the best of all possible worlds bringing Mother Road to, to this company. And also to have, as his swan song in this company, 
for this company, uh, Bill Rausch, at the helm of this play. His generosity, his openness, this, his process is about engaging everyone's opinions and ideas and letting us all build this beast together. And that is absolutely paramount to, to my process in Mother Road. So it's been really, really delicious so far in the last couple of days. I've been working my tail off already, <laughs> but so have they. So have they, and so has Bill, so has everybody. It's going to be that way till we open. But it's going to be, it's just going to be, um, no pun intended, a wild ride on the mother road. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Woo! Christopher. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so this play is about a journey. Characters on a road looking for a place called home. And as a designer, I've been involved in many of these type of plays, for, like Further Adventures of Hedda Gobbler, The Wiz, Head Over Heels, to name a few of these plays that are about collecting a family and moving it to, uh, the, um, to Oz, basically. Um, I, too, have been on a journey with this play. I first heard Mother Road in Chicago uh, at a new play festival in 2015. And although I had read an a earlier draft of it, its full impact resonated with me at that culminating um, Carnaval of New Latino work. Um, two years later, in 2017, we brought the play here to the Latinx Play Project um, as part of that program's mission to invest in Latinx theater makers and giving Octavio another opportunity to hear his play in the mouths of our incredible company. So a second round of going through the Borset process and the play found its way into our season. And here we are two years later after that, embarking on the world premiere of a play here at OSF. At the first reading the other night, it struck me again uh, of this play's impact like it did four years ago. Um, and maybe actually a deeper resonance today in our country. Humans, like birds and buffalo, are migratory animals. For those of us lucky to find home in the place we are born is a privilege other folks have, may not have. Other folks may have to move to find work or love or community, those things that make home the land that we and these characters are searching for. For those that peaked in the model on your way in, I've given the design as much space and openness I could reasonably in the Bomer. Um, I wanted to create a sense of vastness, uh, of loneliness, of an infinite road with no ending and no beginning. This place on an open road holding the possibility between who we are and what we are becoming. That's my presentation. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> nice job. Um, I'm just going to say briefly that uh, Paul James Prendergast, our, our, our sound designer and composer, apologizes. He got stuck in a recording uh, session um, for this play, um, and that's why he's not here. But he is with us through the whole rehearsal process, and the actors know he is the most collaborative, amazing visionary artist, and we're so lucky to have him on this project um, already, uh, just creating great beauty in that room. Uh, and Caitlin Pietras, our uh, uh, video designer, I just wanted to uh, mention to you all that she and her husband took the same journey that Octavio took on the Mother Road, uh, and she uh, videotaped uh, through the front of their car, through the back of their car, and through the side um, the whole journey. And so she's going to incorporate footage of that into her video design for this production, um, which I think is going to be spectacular. Um, let's hear from Carolyn. Let's some clothes. Yeah. Hello. Well, Octavio has written such a beautiful world for these characters to live in. And I remember my first reaction reading it was like, wow, you know, like, and I grew up in Texas. I grew up not in Oklahoma, but it's close to this like area. Um, and so I remember reading it and being like, wow, like I know exactly who he's talking about and who these people are and that they're searching for, you know, for home and history and how 
their pasts are connected to the future and how the future is connected to the present and how the present is again connected to the past and how everything's just building on each other so that William and Martin can come together as both the past and the future to create the present. So, and I took that and I looked at so many images of Okies um, from the time because there's, you know, there's so much uh, documentation of the people that were going there. And I looked around me living in LA at all, at all the, the workers that you don't know where they're from, but it's like, well, what, do, what did the people look like then and what do they look like now? Um, and so again, so much of each character's core identity is rooted in family. And I really took that and started figuring out everybody's past. And so my thought process mostly is that Everybody has a little piece of then, everybody has a little piece of now, and how does that all come together? Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Sherelle. Hi, everyone. So when I'm starting my process, um, designing as well as moving toward the actual building, and I'll get to these pieces. I know you're all wondering what this is. Um, <laughs> so I'll get to those in a minute. One of the things I do, I read the work, and then I sat in a reading, and I talk, and I, I ask questions of the director, and the costume designer, and the playwright, and everyone, um, and sometimes they're quite peculiar questions, because what I'm doing is, in my head, I'm taking in my process, and I'm thinking about the world, but I'm also thinking about the actual actors before me, and how I create them into the character, and then I take a step back, because what I remember is I don't create the character for them, they create the character. So I listen to them and I communicate with them because I wanna see and understand how they feel about who they're portraying because they're the ones who are wearing the pieces on their heads. So th that's a little bit of my process. Um, it's been very interesting because we have, we have William and we have Martine and you'll see on stage when you see their hair how different they are. And you'll see through the hair, I hope you see the different worlds. So with Martine, I, don't, I didn't bring the hair. I'm not gonna bring my hair. <laughs> you have to come see the show. Um, but it's very long, it's very curly. And the individual in which um, he's patterned after, in a sense, his hair is patterned after, the hair is a slightly different texture. But what Carolyn and I decided to do and what was really big for us to do is to follow the natural curl pattern of Tony's hair and to ensure that it could feel as if he grew the hair. It was his own hair that he grew down his back because it changes movement, it changes the way you see things, and it changes the way you feel. A lot of times people often don't think about hair. I'm just gonna be honest, they think about it last. But the first thing you see when you go to see a show is the head, right? Does everyone usually see people's heads? <laughs> so you see the head. And what you're wearing on your head it can really speak to you positively, it can speak to you negatively, or it can just leave you in a neutral space. And so what I'm trying to do, along with the creative team, along with these wonderful actors before you, is talk to them and for us to kind of create something <coughs> together, collaboratively, rather than me think of designs and Carol and I work together and just create something and stick it on their heads. Another part of that, I'll move into these pieces that you see before you, so I'm kind of a hair hunter. And so what I've done is I've taken, not, I didn't take it. They volunteered <laughs> and donated. <laughs> They're locks to me. So you, what you see before you is 100% um, human virgin hair. The hair came from uh, Robbie Rayburn in stage operations. This is his hair. <laughs> this is from Claire Bunch. Uh, she's a first hand in the costume shop. Mm -hmm. And this is from Leanne Flandreau, which is one of our donors here. And what I wanted to do was incorporate real natural hair from different people, from all walks of life, to build on and to expound on. And yes, Jeff King will be wearing a lot of this hair. <laughs> <laughs> He's excited. <laughs> so it was very important to me. Everybody kept asking, like, why are you asking people about their hair? Why are we looking for real hair? And after reading the work, um, I really wanted it to be more intimate, um, rich in culture, just real. 
it's oftentimes a lot of uh, people, they see the hair and they, they see the spectacles or the, I won't say all musicals are spectacles, but we know we go to musicals because it's a bit of a spectacle. And when you read work like this, you have to really read it and reread it because you're dealing with real people. And I don't know about all the other designers, but for myself, sometimes it could be even more challenging designing mm -hmm. for real, authentic people. It's a little bit more challenging because it's not based on the spectacle of a design. It's based on knowing the history, knowing the family values, knowing the culture, and also knowing your actors and how they're feeling about wearing it. So that is my presentation on a little of my box. So the vocal landscape is one that I'm familiar with. It sounds a lot like home. Maika Alicia Espinosa, hija de Manuel Gre Gregorio Espinosa, and daughter of Mary Louise Proctor. I'm a gringa chicana with my roots in El Paso, but more Nogales and Tucson. My mother's family is from Missouri and Oklahoma. Before my mother was orphaned, her family lived on the road in migrant camps while her father helped build dams. Much of my mother's family has passed. Those who remain are farmers in Missouri, and much of my Mexicano-Americano family live in the borderlands and still speak Spanglish. I begin with my origin story because that is what the language and the poetry of Mother Road invokes in me, memory. The themes of our lives are revealed, the mysteries of our families, the pain of our bigotry, the truth of our toxic and beautiful cultura. Our human condition is not new. All the locura and complexities of our multicultural American identities and psychic wounds revealed on a journey from Bakersfield, California to Salisaw, Oklahoma. This is exactly the type of theater that I have longed to be a part of. A piece where the voice is a vehicle for longing and interconnectedness, where the voice cuts through the illusion that we are separate. A piece where the voice like a limb of a tree reaches out to anyone who has ever crossed an imaginary line searching for a dream or their motherland. I've had a few days in the rehearsal hall with these magnificent and talented designers and actors, and I'm honored to work with them, and I look forward to being of service. Hey, Tiffany. Uh, I'm so uh, moved and blessed to be working on this play. Like uh, all of us, I feel a powerful professional and artistic and personal uh, connection to the work. Uh, as a dramaturg, I often think about that m my role is to be a midwife to the work, and part of being a midwife is really listening, and uh, through listening, often it's just being present and uh, watching the rhythms of how people are speaking, the way their bodies are moving, what is happening, and uh, thinking about the multi-layered uh, quality of needs that are happening as part of the process, the needs of the playwright, the needs of the storytelling, the needs of the director, the needs of the actor, uh, the needs of the audience, as well as the theater company and the community. So that's a, a point from which uh, I enter the work. It's more than just listening to provide the research that's needed, but really listening to what are the opportunities coming up in the stories. Um, I too have a, a personal connection to this work. My mother uh, grew up in Oildale uh, area, California, Lancaster area. Her family uh, were Okies. She's white and before I was born, one of the things I discovered during my growing up years was that my mother had had a child before I was born that back in the day uh, gave that child away didn't go through former ch channels of adoption, but just gave it away. And it, the child found their way to a family and grew up in Oklahoma. And then my grandparents were migrant farm workers. My father grew up a child migrant farm worker. I can tell you very little about either side of my family history because those histories were so infused 
with trauma and violence, they were unspeakable and they therefore became undocumented. And the way we powerfully document these stories that literally uh, in, stay with us in the fabric of our DNA is uh, often through the stories that we tell to one another. And it's a huge gift when we're able to hear the stories. Octavio talked about the play was born through just the act of being present and bearing witness to the stories that people bring to you. Um, so it's been a, a really incredible process to uh, witness this work from early uh, drafts of it, going back to Encuentro in Chicago, um, to seeing the reading here with the Latinx Play Project, to just the process in the room and how we're all listening and sharing stories and thinking about our moment together. Um, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, this whole notion of who we are and who we're becoming, um, listening is a gift, and how do we, when we are carrying the burden of traumatic memory, become present to listen to one another? Often there's just so much noise in our heads, we can't listen, and I think part of the journey is to be present not only to what we're hearing from other people, but to be present with those noises, the disruption, the discomfort <coughs> that comes in the voices in our own heads to hear what we're trying to tell ourselves, especially when we're connected with other people. And this, the journey of the play being on the road, uh, the spaces people are sitting with together throughout the play, uh, it, it's about that journey to listen to the self as well as other people. So it's um, very, very, there's so much to say about this work but uh, it, it really, uh, it, it's a very, very emotional and powerful experience to think about the um, resonances of Steinbeck's story, uh, The Grapes of Wrath, to think about the UFW uh, video, The Wrath of Grapes, and uh, where we're at in the present moment that we're living in and all of these traumas. I, I would, uh, in, in histories that we carry with us, I would say the last thing is, um, in thinking about when we bear witness to these kinds of stories, people are not regarded as fully human unless their pain can be acknowledged. Their histories of pain, their histories of violence. And we have yet in this country to fully acknowledge the histories of pain and violence that everybody is carrying as part of their cultural experiences. So many cultural people um, their stories are not connected to the pain that they carry and the wounds that they carry and the healings they, healing they seek. Uh, and that's what I think is a really powerful part of this play is bringing us together in this arena of storytelling to bear witness to that. So huge honor to be a part of this work. And uh, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for joining us. Mm -hmm. <laughs>